All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to MS Neuro TV, brought to you by MS Fusion News and sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene. So, first of all, um, we'd like to thank all of you who are joining us here tonight. Um, we're glad to see that so many of you um, are following us each and every month. And we've received so much uh, kind feedback from you guys. Um, so we really wanted to thank you for that. We really appreciate it. And we're glad that you've been enjoying the webinar so far. So if this is your first MS Neuro TV webinar, then welcome. Um, we hope that you enjoy our monthly series of interviews with multiple sclerosis specialists. And we hope that you'll keep joining us. My name is Anna Fernandez de Castro and I'm the Assistant Development Coordinator at MS Views and News, and I'm here with Jennifer Falk, our Director of Development. Hi, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> so MS Views and News is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing education and information to the multiple sclerosis community. So today we have Dr. Megan Weigel with us, and she will be talking to us about MS relapses including how to recognize relapses, how to manage them effectively, treatment options, and a little bit more about your road to recovery. Dr. Megan Weigel is a nurse practitioner specializing in MS care in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. She has been an MS certified nurse since 2005 and a nurse practitioner for 17 years. She earned her doctorate of nursing practice from the University of Florida and her practice has an emphasis on wellness. In 2015, she was recognized as one of North Florida's top 100 nurses. She will complete a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona in the fall of this year. She is also the past president of the International Organization of MS Nurses, serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of MS Care, and enjoys and enjoyed her years of service on the Healthcare Advisory Committee for her local MS Society chapter. She is a co-founder of OMS Yoga, a nonprofit organization that brings free yoga classes to people living with MS along the East Coast. She especially enjoys educating people living with MS and peers about the importance of wellness as an integral piece of MS treatment. Okay, so we're about to play a 10 minute video interview with Dr. Weigel. And after the video, Dr. Weigel will be available for a live 15 minute Q&A with us. So we know that your privacy is important, so your questions will be anonymous, so you won't have to worry about that. Um, all that we ask is that you please keep your questions on topic and complete the quick survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. So for those of you who are calling in tonight and do not have video access, please know that you will hear about 10 minutes of silence now while we play the pre-recorded video interview. But don't worry, please still stay on the line um, because once the video is done playing, you'll be able to hear us again during the live Q&A with Dr. Weigel. Okay, let's begin. to MS Neuro TV, presented by MS Views and News. MS Neuro TV is a comprehensive educational program bringing together MS professionals from across the United States covering the topics that you want to learn more about. To register for MS Neuro TV webinars, visit www.msviewsandnews.org. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the program. Good evening, Megan. 
And I'm glad that you're back again. And you know, tonight we would like to speak with you concerning the topics about relapse, recognizing MS relapse, effective management, treatment options, and the recovery. So the first thing I would like to ask you is, what are the common signs and symptoms of a multiple sclerosis relapse, or as some people know it, as simply an exacerbation or flare-ups? Well, that's a loaded question, Stu, because as we all know, MS is different for each person. So I like to talk to people living with MS about um, just kind of keeping a mental note of what is a good day for them, what is a bad day for them, and what is an, oh my God, what the hell is happening to me day for them. So any time that you have a bad day that becomes two bad days in a row, so symptoms that you're used to having, but they're much worse than they usually are when you have a bad day, or when you have an, oh my God, what the hell is happening to me kind of day. So that means you have a new neurological event that you have never had before that lasts um, you know, longer than 24 hours. Um, then it's time to call your um, MS provider and, and find out whether or not you're having a relapse. Um, sometimes those bad days can actually be pseudo relapses, which would indicate you have something else going on, like an infection, or um, maybe you overdid it on the weekend, or you it, here in Florida, you know, were exposed to heat for a period of time. So pseudo relapses get better when you treat the problem. So tell us about the actual time frame that you that people should know that, oh my gosh, I'm you know, feeling crappy today, as you said, but you know, are they really having a relapse? Are they having the pseudo relapse that you just speak, spoke about? Or are they um, not really knowing for sure it, one way or the other, but how long should they wait before they even say, yes, I think I'm going through something, and when should they call their clinician? So. I'm going to give a couple examples um, based on phone calls that I get a lot in my clinic. And one of those examples um, is with a visual problem. So um, people have floaters, which are like little black spots that float by in the eye. Um, people also have migraine with visual disturbances. And those visual disturbances usually look like disco balls or flashes or, um, you know, more positive colors and visual loss. And those things usually are brief, like 30 minutes to an hour, and then your vision returns to baseline. Um, people should call about those things if they've never happened before. However, they don't indicate MS relapse most of the time. So what would, would be you wake up, your eyes kind of fuzzy, and as the day goes on, it's getting fuzzier and fuzzier, or you're losing you know, a, a part of your vision. So if you wake up with a new symptom and it gets worse as the day goes on, instead of totally resolving in 30 minutes to an hour, that could indicate a relapse. It's time to call the doctor. If you're having a bad day and your bad day lasts for more than a day, then it's time to call the doctor to make sure that you don't have an infection or something else going on. Um, the third thing I'd like to mention um, is you know, in, in America today, we have a, an aging population, um, and also many people living with MS have vascular conditions, things like diabetes, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and obesity. And so they're at risk for stroke. So if a person with MS has the sudden onset of a neurological symptom, like numbness, weakness, incoordination, visual loss, double vision, um, it might be time to call 911 versus calling your your neurologist. And again, though, going back to a, an actual time frame of if somebody's feeling really off peak, do they, should it be that they get on the phone right away with, the, with their clinician? Or maybe is it more known that they're having a relapse because it's gone about 48 hours? Well, again, I think if it's, if it's a if it's symptoms that you've already had before um, and they're worse, then I think a good time frame is 24 to 48 hours to see whether or not those things are gonna get better. But if it's a new symptom um, and it, it doesn't go away within 30 minutes to an hour, um, and I'm speaking from the standpoint of a person living with MS who might be scared, you can call your doctor anytime. As far as our definition of a relapse goes though, it's the worsening of old symptoms that's not related to something else for more than 24 to 48 hours or new symptoms that last more than 24 hours. Great. So on a, on a topic that um, is related to this, so people who live in the South primarily or even in the North in the summertime, um, 
you know, fatigue is a common symptom of multiple sclerosis, but how does a person know when they're actually more fatigued than their normal fatigue, and is it directly affected to the heat, or could it be affected to the cold, or just in general? What might be your aspects about that? So there are case reports in the literature of people having MS relapses that are completely characterized by increased severity of fatigue. So how do you know if your fatigue constitutes a relapse, or, for example, um, that you did too much or heat? So um, if it's heat related, your fatigue is going to improve with cooling and rest. Um, and, and that should be pretty clear to you. And it might take a couple of days. It might not take putting on a cooling vest or sitting in the air conditioning for, you know, an hour. Um, if it is related to just doing too much, then resting for a few days should help. Um, if it is indicative of a, of a relapse and you don't have any other neurological symptoms, then that fatigue's probably going to stick around for a couple of weeks before it gets better. And for a person that lives with pain, normal pain for that person, if it increases in any way where it becomes, you know, so great that it's that it's also taken up more than a, a normal day of time and it's now shutting them down from being able to get out of their home or go to work. Um, what, do, what do you have to say to a person like that? I mean, that clearly means they should be calling their health care provider, right? But um, that the type of pain is also important. So if it's an increase, an increase in neurogenic pain, like spasticity or numbness, tingling, burning type pain, then it could be MS related. Um, but if it's an increase in, say, musculoskeletal pain or back pain, then it could indicate something else is going on, like an inflamed joint or even a, a compression fracture or a stress fracture. So increases in pain like that, particularly if they're limiting your ability to, um, to move, basically, it's, it's time to call the, the doctor. Yeah, another thing that um, is totally unaware to a lot of people is that they may be looking for the more common things that might be a relapse, but what if all of a sudden they have finger problems with their fingers, with their dexterity, with, with buttoning their buttons or, or um, and again, this is just a new onset and it's, you know, they're having these problems during the course of the day and they're not having heart related issues, but that it is just, you know, they're, again, they're having problems lifting things, maybe using a fork, maybe buttoning their buttons, doing other things, even as simple as brushing their teeth. Could it be something that's new that's happening to them? Oh, absolutely. So anytime a person living with MS has a new neurological symptom, um, and it is, you know, getting worse as the day is going on, it could indicate a relapse. And um, sometimes that incoordination, um, you know, you go to reach for a cup and you miss the cup, or you are having a hard time, um, uh, you know, picking up things, not necessarily because you can't feel them, but because your fingers won't do the work like they should. Um, that can indicate a relapse that is coming from the brain or even from the um, cervical spinal cord. So that's, a, that's an important time to call as well. Great, thank you for that. Now, now that we know about all these different relapses, what does a person do? I mean, are there treatments for these, for the MS relapse, and, and what is the effectiveness of those treatments? Yes, yeah, so there are treatments, um, and I think the first thing that I like to tell people is that our treatments for relapses and MS shorten the duration of the relapse. Um, so they get you back to your baseline or your new baseline sooner than you would be if you just let the relapse run its course. But they ultimately don't affect the course of your MS over time. So let's say you have a relapse and you, um, you have numbness on the left side of your body. Um, um, and you don't you decide not to to use steroids which are our ma main treatment for relapses and three months go by and you still have a little bit of numbness on the left side um, it's not as bad as it was but it's still there you know you can notice it um, and you say to yourself well gosh I'm really dumb you know I should have taken those steroids that my doctor offered me throw that out because all the steroids would have done is shorten the duration of the severity of that numbness. You're still gonna be the same whether you took the steroids or not. So after a relapse, you'll, you'll either go back to baseline or you may actually have a new normal um, and, and have acquired a little bit of disability. That's why we don't like relapses. So um, 
treatment includes steroids, and you can give them in many ways. You can, um, the most traditional way to give them is IV, and it's usually three to five days of IV steroids. Um, we're having some issues in this country with access to, you mentioned rural care, so access to infusion centers. It's not easy to get home health care anymore. Um, there's a lot of criteria that need to be met to get a home care nurse out to your house. Um, and believe it or not, some insurance companies are actually requiring prior authorization for steroids. So when we need steroids, we need them now, not three weeks from now, right? So sometimes we give people high dose oral steroids um, and it takes, you you know, it's a longer duration of therapy and there um, are more side effects, but sometimes we do that. There's also a medication called ACTH that we can give people and that's an injection either um, in the skin or uh, under in the muscle um, that we give people for five days. We treat relapses. <laughs> Great. So is the ACTH also known as Acthar? Yes, ACTH is also known as Acthar gel, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, Megan. This was a wonderful evening. All right, terrific. Now it's your time. It's time for questions and answers with Dr. Megan Weigel. Um, hopefully you can see in the top uh, right-hand corner of your screen, there should be a box that says uh, type questions here. You should see a little orange arrow. Uh, if you don't see the box, you should be able to click on that orange arrow and it should open up the box for you where you can type in questions. Um, Nobody can see your questions. I will be reading them to Dr. Megan Weigel as they come in. I'll read them in the order that they are received and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. We have a lot of people on the line and this is a really important topic. Um, so Megan, um, are you there with us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you guys. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And thanks for that wonderful interview. It was full of incredible information that everyone really needs to know and, and wants to learn more about. Um, so welcome. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So we have a lot of questions and um, I have my first question that's coming in is, um, do relapses mean that it's time to change your medication? So that, that's a really good question, and it's a really loaded question, too. So because we have so many choices these days um, with disease-modifying therapy, um, we really have a low threshold for accepting that someone has had a change either in their relapse rate or a change in their MRI. Um, but I think that it's also important to keep in mind the interval with which that change has occurred. So if you've been on your disease modifying therapy for five to 10 years and you've had your first relapse or your first MRI change in five to 10 years, then the conversation about changing a disease modifying therapy might look a lot different than if you have had your second relapse in a year or your second relapse in two years, which would be a lot more alarming and a lot more unacceptable. We have to keep in mind that our disease-modifying therapies are not perfect. None of them reduce relapse rate by 100%. None of them reduce MRI changes by 100%. And none of them stop disability progression. So, um, so I think we have to really keep in mind the... Um, evidence from the clinical trials and apply it to the, a real world, world person, which is you. So it very much depends on when your last relapse was, when your M last MRI change was, um, and then what your history of disease modifying therapy uh, looks like. So I hope that helps. It does, it does. And it actually leads to the next question, which is, um, do I have to have a new MRI at every relapse? Um, so I, in my practice, I do not necessarily demand an MRI at every relapse um, because if a person 
is having a new neurological symptom that they haven't had before. Um, and it's very evident on exam. There is no reason why we need to send you for a $3,000 test to prove it because we've proved it with our physical exam. Um, it, it, the, the caveat to that would be, do you suspect something else besides MS? For example, do you have risk factors for stroke? Could this have been a stroke? Um, is there concern about PML uh, or a brain infection? Then in those cases, an MRI would be in order. But I think, um, you know, depending on how you're presenting with your relapse symptoms, an MRI is not always necessary. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, what works better, steroids or ACTH? So ACTH and steroids have not been um, shown to have one superior to the other. Um, in fact, they, they both work as well as one another. Um, the, the decision to use ACTH instead of steroids uh, would be because you don't tolerate steroids well. Uh, for example, um, the side effects are are inappropriate for you, or um, y you know you can't you can't tolerate the side effects of steroids, or you have tried steroids for relapse and um, your re you don't typically respond to relapse. Uh, I'm sorry, to steroids for your relapse. So you take steroids, you don't get better. Um, so that is, um, that would be the reason why you would use ACTH instead of steroids. Um, IV steroids, uh, really are the gold standard of care. Um, they're also much less expensive. Now, um, one other piece of information about ACTH is if, if you have poor venous access, so your veins are, are just, you know, completely blown out because, um, uh, because of overuse from, you know, using them for um, steroids and antibiotics and things like that. That's another reason to use ACTH. Okay, great. All right, thank you. And um, I guess you, you did bring up side effects and someone's question is, what are the side effects of steroids and what are the side effects of um, ACTH or would it be different for every individual? So the side effects uh, for steroids and ACTH, if you're going to pull out, I call it the um, uh, the the auction pamphlet. So mm -hmm. if you if you pull out the prescribing information um, for both drugs, you're going to see um, that the st the side effects are very similar. So both steroids and ACTH can cause you to have um, a little bit of anxiety or insomnia, a little bit of swelling, um, or very temporary weight gain. Both can cause increase, increases in blood pressure or blood sugar um, with long, and both can increase your risk of infection. With long-term use, both can um, put you at risk for adrenal insufficiency, osteoporosis, cataracts, um, uh, and um, avascular necrosis. So just, you know, things that, um, that's why we don't want to give you either ACTH or steroids over and over and over again. Many people will say, well, I, I, just, I feel so good when I take steroids. Why can't I have those all the time? And that's the reason why. Um, that being said, one of the reasons that we prescribe ACTH instead of steroids is because you've taken steroids and you have very severe side effects from them. Um, one of the more severe side effects of both uh, steroids and ACTH can actually be um, uh, psychosis. <laughs> so that would be a reason to try one uh, over the other. Um, in clinical practice, not in, in scientific trials, but in clinical practice, I think that you would find most MS specialists say that people tend to have fewer side effects um, from ACTH than they do uh, from steroids, and those side effects being all the ones that I 
just mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you. And so mm -hmm. in, in your experience, would you say that it is a choice of the patient on, on which treatment they would receive? Um, well, I think that it's, it's probably more a, a shared decision because the, I don't know of, a, of an insurance company that would approve ACTH if you've never had steroids. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that it's important to, when you're going to decide whether or not to take that medication, um, you have to have very good reasons to take it instead of steroids. So um, I think it would be something that you and your MS provider would come to together. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. And um, I have another question here. Um, can a real relapse be triggered by heat or too much exercise? And it's, it's really two questions in one. So can a real, real relapse be triggered by too much heat and exercise? And what is happening to my body um, when I have extreme fatigue and push myself too hard? Okay. So good question. Um, a real relapse really should not be triggered by heat exposure or exercise. So those things can trigger what we call pseudo relapses. Um, and that means that um, you have recurrence of your old symptoms for a period of time. And usually that period of time is um, you resting or cooling down. Now, if you have a new neurological symptom that you've never had before, um, and it comes following exercise or prolonged heat exposure, um, it's possible that it's a coincidence. It's possible that they're related. But in general, what you find with prolonged heat exposure exercise is that your old symptoms get annoying until you've removed the offending problem, which most of the case is either cooling down or resting. People ask me, can I hurt myself by exercising? Can, um, can I cause a relapse by exercising or by being in the heat? And truthfully, you, you shouldn't be able to do that, but you could exacerbate some of your symptoms and cause what we call a pseudo relapse. Okay. Okay, great. So, so pushing uh, the, the question of what is happening to her body when she pushes um, and too then much. extreme fatigue. Yeah. Too much. If, she, if she's having her symptoms that she has had in the past re, resurface, then she's just pushing herself a little too hard. She may want to... Um, uh, time her exercise better so that she's exercising at um, for a, a shorter period of time, maybe a couple of times a day, or make sure she's using cooling equipment when she's exercising. Those would be things that I would recommend. Excellent. Thank you. And um, mm -hmm. actually, we're going to wrap up, but I have uh, one final question. Um, do you find that people usually return to baseline, to their original baseline after a relapse? And in general, how long does that take? Um, so most people early on in their disease return to their baseline level of neurological status. Um, because MS is a degenerative disease, even from the outset, um, and you uh, do lose um, neurons, you do lose neuronal tissue um, as the years go on. Um, and most people with MS after many years will become secondary progressive. And that looks a lot different in our current era of disease modifying therapy than it used to. Um, but because of that, as one of the signs that you're moving towards a more progressive phase of relapsing MS is that when you have a relapse, you do not return to baseline. Um, so that's something that your MS provider would be looking for because that would indicate that 
um, your your brain reserve isn't such that you can go back to where you were before. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense that most people early on in the disease course will return to baseline and incomplete recovery from relapse is a sign to us that um, that the the disease is more serious um, and um, more in a, in a progressive phase. Yes, the, the terrific answer. Thank you. Um, we have one more really quick question. I'm trying to get to everybody. Oh, sure. um, someone is asking us, are pseudo relapses treated the same as a relapse? Are they treated with steroids? No. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a really great question. Pseudo relapses are treated by re removing the offending problem. So, for example, if you have a um, if you have a urinary tract infection that's causing um, mm -hmm. your symptoms to uh, be more active uh, or to, you know, to flare up, then you're going to treat the urinary tract infection. And once that's gone, then your symptoms will improve. If you have been at Disney World for three days with your family and you're extremely fatigued and weak and your vision is blurry, then rest and staying in the air conditioning for five days is going to improve your symptoms. If you have a fever, treating the fever is going to improve your symptoms. Um, so, so we treat the symptoms that cause the, uh, the flare to make your um, MS go back to where it usually is. That's great. Thank you. Very clear um, answers. And, and thank you for all of this information. It's been absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Weigel. Um, so I think um, right now we're going to to close it up. Um, we'd like to once again thank all of you that uh, have been on the line and asking questions and stay engaged and, and involved in your journey with MS. And uh, we're very happy to have you on, on with us and learning every month. Um, so thank you, Dr. Weigel. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Anna Christina now. I think she has some closing closing words for us. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thanks a lot, Megan. Um, we've had, um, this was a great webinar. Thank you for answering so many uh, great questions um, tonight. Yeah, that our audience has sent us. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again to all of you who have joined us here today on MS Neuro TV. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you could please complete the brief survey that's going to pop up as soon as the webinar is finished, um, because as you know, your feedback is very important to us so that we can continue to customize our events around you guys. So our next webinar will be coming up on Tuesday, September 4th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, we'll have Dr. Donald Negroski, and he will be discussing um, how to know when to switch MS therapies. Plus, he'll also be explaining um, when to consider making this big switch and how to discuss this with your doctor and with your entire MS care team. So if you're joining today's webinar live, then that's awesome. You're already registered for the entire series. Just keep a lookout for our reminder emails for instructions on how to join our next webinar on September 4th. If you are not registered for this series yet, um, you can find the registration link on our website, our Facebook page, or in this video's YouTube description. This video will soon be uploaded to our MS Views and News YouTube learning channel, so make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on your notifications so that you're able to get alerts on all our latest uploads, including videos of our live events. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So if you've been enjoying these webinars so far, uh, please make sure you visit our website and check out our free live educational events that we have all over the United States. Um, it, new locations are constantly being added um, to our calendar. So if you don't see anything in your area right now, um, just uh, keep taking a look at it every, every now and then because we are constantly adding new locations. For more information on any of our events, and what's new in the world of multiple sclerosis, please visit our website at www.msvn.org. And last but certainly not least, we'd like to give a big thank you to Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene 
for their ongoing support this year in making this webinar series possible and for their contributions to the entire Multiple Sclerosis community. And again, thank you everyone for joining us here today and we hope to see you all again next month. Good night.